friends, welcome to TAP, which stands for Theology Automated for the People. And this is week two of our brothers and sisters TAP. And so we're going to jump into uh, what the Old Testament has to say about men and women working together. So um, it's a lot of content, so I'm going to do my best to fly through it and summarize it quickly. I've been at the fair all day. I'm excited about this topic, so we'll try to keep it below 40 minutes. But um, here we go. So first things first, the goal of all Christian instruction is of course worship, and so go ahead and hit pause, hit that pause button, and ask yourself this, what Old Testament story do you love for what it reveals about the Lord? So what Old Testament story do you love? Uh, because as you push through that story, it reveals something about God to you. And so hit pause, if you're watching this with friends, discuss it together, and then we'll press on. Today we're going to be looking at Deborah, who comes from the book of Judges, chapter 4 and 5, and then we're going to look at the Proverbs 31 woman, which of course comes from Proverbs 31, and hopefully by the end, uh, we'll see these glimpses. So much of the Old Testament are these things that go wrong and how God is faithful anyways. And what I think we can see in this Deborah story and Proverbs 31 proverb is actually a picture of what goes right. But oftentimes, I think these two stories are used in ways that they're almost weapons. It's a weird thing, but we'll jump into it. But I think that these two stories are actually rather beautiful and show uh, what a man should look for in a wife when it comes to Proverbs 31, and then how a man and a woman actually partner together to bring about good and flourishing for the people of Israel in the time of the Judges. So, all right, let's jump in. When you think of the book of Judges, what comes to mind when you think of that book? We had some people say failure. Uh, we had some people say, like, you know, settling the land. But a lot of words that were synonyms to failure, screwing up, messing up, spiraling downward, that's kind of the main thing of Judges is it's just there's this cycle of there's a judge things go well people rebel bad things happen they repent god raises up a new judge but the whole time we're having these cycles imagine though it's like a twister moving downward ultimately and so the book of judges that's probably what you think of but when i ask you what comes to mind when you hear deborah's story we had some people say well deborah was only a prophet and a judge because barack failed to do his job or because no one else was doing the thing. As some commentators put it, Deborah was there because a good man was hard to find, which I think is actually not the point of this story. And so as we jump into it, I will hopefully be able to push back against uh, some of those interpretations. But the story of Judges, push pause, go read chapter four of Judges. If you want, read chapter five. It's super fun. We didn't have time in class, but those two chapters are really fun. Chapter four is the story of the battle. And chapter five is a recap, and it's a very normal thing to have the battle and then have like a battle hymn, which recaps what happened. And you get to find out who the heroes and all that. But as we read Judges 4, we have a modern day problem. And part of why I say modern day problem is many of the ancient people wouldn't have had as big of a problem with this as we would. But our modern day problem is that when we get to Deuteronomy 1, it says that a judge shall be a practical man, an ish. And then it goes on and says, hey, he's supposed to judge fairly, he's supposed to do rightly, and all these things. So if it's supposed to be a man, why do we have an Isha, a woman, Deborah, doing the job that a man should do? Now, I say this is a modern problem. Moderns think of laws like statutes. We are statutory law people. We think our constitution is the embodiment of justice in the West, especially white people. And so if you're driving down the road and you uh, the speed limit is 35 and you go 45, there is a statute for that. That's the law. In the Old Testament, though, they believe in causistic law, which is to say, hey, what's the heart behind it? And what would wisdom say is the right response? So you're driving 35, but you're going 45 in a speed limit, but it's because your wife is in labor in the back seat. You might not get a ticket. Now, you may not get it in the United States either, because the whole point is the law is designed to keep people safe, and you're breaking it because you're trying to keep someone safe. Now, that is a broad stroke, way over generalization. Do not stretch that. Do not use that metaphor beyond what I'm trying to explain here, but this is a modern problem. It's the ancients would not have thought about it in the same way. So the question though for us becomes, are we allowed to have a female judge? It says have an Ish and we have an Isha here. Are we allowed to have this? Well, apparently yes. I mean like, yes, because we have Deborah. But so many other commentators said, no, 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 something's wrong here. Wayne Grudem says something is abnormal, something is wrong. There are no men to function as a judge, exclamation point. He got excited about that. Tom Schreiner says, oh, no, 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 her work was only done in private. She wasn't a public leader. Do not get confused about the role that she's playing. But if you pushed pause 
and you've read Judges 4, nothing about what Deborah's doing is private. She is out in the public under a tree deciding cases between, nation, between the tribes within the nation of Israel. Uh, and then Thomas Finley states that she can only do her job because she's submitting to the leadership of Barak. And yet we see her giving commands to Barak. And so I will point out the three things these men have in common is that they're all complementarians, which is fine. You can be a complementarian. But that means they're going to bring their biases to the text. They're going to probably think, gosh, it's normal to have men in positions of leadership. So when we have a woman in a position of leadership, rather than going, huh, what's going on here? Sometimes, and I know I'm accusing them of being biased. I realize what I'm doing, but we all do this. We all come to the text biased. And I would venture to guess that maybe their biases might have led them to some of these conclusions. They can fight me later if they want. They don't know who I am. They'll never hear about this. So I want to point something out, though. Part of the reason why we have these conclusions, though, is because from our archaeological evidence, it seems as if men were only in positions of leadership over Israel. So part of this is their own biases, but part of it is because the archaeological evidence that we think we have, we think points to only men were in these positions. However, I asked our class, I said, humor me. If for a day someone gave you a magic wand and said, you can study any topic you want from the Old Testament, and you get to be an archaeologist, so you get to go dig up all the pertinent things, what is the question you want answered? And I had the men go in one part of the room and the women stayed in another, and I just said, what is the question that you want to ask? And, and I didn't know how this would go for us as a class, but it went, it went beautifully because I even took a photo of it. The men wanted to know, wait, how big really was Goliath, which is, of course, a battle scene. They also want to know, tell us about the ark and the flood and all of that. Cool story. That's not necessarily male-centric. But then they also said, we want to know about when that judge kills everybody with a jawbone. Again, a battle scene. This is typical questions men ask. They ask questions like, what was the battle like? How big were they? Questions that pertain to a lot of what men have enjoyed in their studies. But women, interestingly enough, ask different questions. What do their homes look like? How did they cook? Tell us about their midwifery, their transportation, things like that. I'm not being like boys are from Mars and, and girls are from Venus type thing. What my point is, is oftentimes you ask the questions that relate to what you do, okay? Which is, that's a normal thing. Like I, if I were to go in the ancient world, would want to know about women in leadership because that's what I do. And so many of you are like, I'm an architect. I'd like to know about the building. Some of you are cooks and you want to know about the cooking utensils. So one of the things that's interesting that's happened over the years is more and more women have gotten into the field of archaeology. And as that has happened, there's a woman named Susan Ackerman who wrote an article saying, actually, something like that, but actually, actually in the time of, of Deborah, whenever she is a judge, it was actually a little bit more normal during that time period before the monarchy, so when it was tribal judges, it was actually a little bit more normal for women to have more power. And the reason why, power and influence, and the reason why, it was just a flatter society. And so there's this idea of like men work and women stay home is a very white Western post-industrial revolution construct. Prior to the industrial revolution and in most of the world today, everyone worked. And often what you did was you had a family business or you had a family thing. And so women might make bread, which allowed them to then barter and make deals when it came to bread. They did the weaving. They did things that allowed the women to have some influence. And so Susan Agerman makes the argument that this seems weird to us and to these guys, but probably the more archaeology that we dig up, it wouldn't have been that absurd to have a woman in this position. It is unique. It's not the norm, but it's probably not as absurd as it feels like to these three guys. So my point in this is, is with the, with the better archaeology and with the better technology and with the better resources that we have, it allows us to go, hey, maybe some of those preconceived biases and notions that we bring, maybe if we're asking better questions, we may get better info. And so my point is, is even though Deborah is different, I mean, she's the only female judge that we have, it maybe wouldn't have been that absurd. It might not be because there were no men around, is my point in that. It might have just been because she's a woman who wielded a lot of power and influence, and God put her in a position of authority. But more than all that, who cares what archaeology says? At the end of the day, I mean, archaeology is a tool that helps us understand our scriptures. At the end of the day, we're asking the question, but what does the Bible say? That's the question that we're ultimately trying to get after. 
I ripped all this material off from a book called Vindicating the Vixens. I cannot encourage you enough to grab that book. It's fantastic. It does a lot of what we're going to be doing today. It looks at stories of women, how they have historically been interpreted, and then how, as we take another look at them with some of the better research that's coming out, have we maybe missed some things? Have we put too much weight on one verse instead of looking at the whole counsel of scripture? So if you didn't push pause and read Judges 4 and 5, you really should, but if you didn't, let me give you the context. Israel is under the thumb of the Canaanites. The Canaanites are their, are their neighbors. They were supposed to run them completely out of the land under Joshua. They don't. And so they've been under their thumb for 20 years, especially in the north. They've been creating problems for them. Jabin is the Canaanite leader, and Sisera is his general. Deborah is a judge and also a prophetess, and she's either the wife of some man named Labadoth, which means fire, or, Hebrew's weird, y'all, or she is a woman of fire, which is what I think is actually happening in the Hebrew, but it can be either one. Hebrew, not my favorite subject. Why can't y'all just have rules and obey the rules? That's fine. I didn't write Hebrew. It's fine. Uh, the Israelites come to her, to Deborah, though, to settle their disputes. This is what we see in the text. And we're in the middle of one of our cycles. She is a raised up leader, and she's actually going to be one of the best ones in the book. So our major players, we have Deborah, Barak. Barak is her general, is Deborah's general. And then we've got Jael, who's going to be a woman who literally hammers a tin peg through Sisera's head, and then Sisera. Sisera has 900 iron chariots. That's supposed to stand out to you. Barak has foot soldiers, okay? Chariots. Men on chariots, iron chariots, <coughs> run you over, okay? So they are outnumbered and out, well, maybe not out, they may not necessarily be outnumbered, but they are out, you know, instrumented, weaponed. They are out weaponed by a large amount. And they're up in the, in the north harassing them. So they're up here in this area harassing these tribes up here. But this is a really important trade route. So the Israelites, this is their whole region. If you remember, during this time, the different tribes have their own regions. You've got Asher, Naphtali, you've got uh, Ephraim, Bethel, sort of, or that's not a tribe, but you get what I'm saying. This is an important part. This is where Barak is, and he's dealing with Sisera being a butthead. Deborah is down here between Ramah and Bethel. She's a southern girl. She speaks long, and she drinks sweet tea, and so Deborah is our southern girl. And the reality is, is she's probably safe down here. So she's, she, as important as this is for the nation, when it comes to the tribe that she belongs to and the area she's in, she's probably not being harassed, which is an interesting point. So the narrator in this book goes to great lengths to point out to us that she is a woman. He does recognize that this is odd. It's not absurd, but it is odd. And so he uses a string of verbs and all these things to basically say, um, hey, Deborah, a woman, a prophet, using a feminine noun, a woman of light or fire, this is what I think he's saying, she herself, added emphasis, she was judging, okay? So he's like, a woman named Deborah, she herself, she was a female prophetess, she, she was doing these things, she was judging, and you're like, got it. Okay, so that's how he, he introduces it. Like I said, Deborah can either mean the wife of Lapidoth, or it can mean a woman of fire. That fire word, there are other two times in the book of Judges it's used for the word fire. And one of the first rules of how you interpret a word is you look at its immediate context and you look at how it's used in the rest of the book. That word in this book two other times is used as fire, which is why many commentators say, no, no, she's not the wife of a man whose name means fire. She's a woman of fire, which is awesome because Barak's name is lightning. And I think that they are fire and lightning, but... That's just me. I just think people are missing out on how cool these partnerships are. But anyways, so fire and lightning, Barak and Deborah, they're going to partner together to free the Israelites under the Canaanite thumb. The point of all this, of emphasizing Deborah, she's this person, is Barak goes, before Barak ever gets on the scene, okay, the author is emphasizing to us that Deborah is the one doing these things. She's the boss. She's not under Barak's leadership, with all due respect to that scholar, and she's not in private. Prophets do this, prophet, prophesy publicly. They do their judge, judges do their judging publicly. The reason why we have judges at this point in time is people have disputes that they can't settle, and so they go to a judge, a person who is esteemed to be practical and wise, and that person decides between those two parties fairly and rightly and, and with justice in mind, and that's what Deborah is doing. She is their judge, period, is what the, the author of Judges is trying to tell you. 
And so Deborah is not the only one who is both a prophet and a judge. Samuel was also a prophet and a judge. He also did his work in the same area as Deborah. I think the two of them are meant to be compared and contrasted as two heavy hitters in the life of Israel, Deborah and Samuel. And both are spoken of very highly if you're giving them their due diligence, I believe. Deb calls for Barak and he comes, which tells you the kind of authority she had. Because remember, he's up north and she's in the south and she's like, Barak. And then she says to him, I have something to tell you from the Lord. Now remember, a prophet. We always hear prophecy and what we think, because it sounds cool and because we always get a couple of verses around Christmas, is we think the prophets are books primarily about future telling events. That's what we think prophets and prophecy are. That is not primarily the role of a prophet. The prophet is, at its most basic sense, a person that speaks on behalf of God. And often, it's about events that either God is rebuking them for, or he is telling them what they have said. This is a normal thing happening. Barak, a general in the army, comes to see a prophet, and what Deborah does is she says, I'm going to tell you the prophecy that God has given to you. And then she speaks to him as if a prophet would. And she says, hey, listen, God's going to give them over to you. Don't, you don't need to worry about it. And by the way, it's not going to be because of you that you get the glory. A woman's going to get the glory. Now, this is where all of the tension in this text happens, okay? Deborah starts to speak her word of prophecy. She is speaking on behalf of God. And she says, hey, you're going to go get the victory. You're going to go up against Sisera. Barak interrupts her and says, okay, but you have to come with me. And then Deborah continues and says, okay, a woman's going to get the glory. And people go, ah, see, Barak's a coward. The whole reason Barak's not getting the glory and why a woman's getting the glory is because he hesitated. He was too scared to go by himself. Okay, that's putting an awful lot of weight on one verse. When Barak is willing to go into battle, when Barak is spoken of highly at other places in the scriptures, both in Samuel as well in Hebrews, he is called a guy who conquers the kingdoms for the Lord. He does what Deborah tells him to when he's facing down 900 chariots and he's got foot soldiers. So what scholars think is actually happening here is Deborah has a full oracle to give him, a full word from God. And Barak just interrupts it. So the response, a woman's going to is gonna get the glory, is not in response to what Barak has said. It was just a part of it. So it's sort of like the whole article is, you're going to go fight Sisera, you're going to win, but a woman's going to get the ultimate glory. And Barak goes, okay, great, will you come with me? But what happens is he gets sandwiched in here, and now people go, oh, he, he's a coward. But he's not, he's not cowardly at any other moment here. Not only that... It is so normal for a general to ask a prophet to be with them because they want them to speak on behalf of God. There's this hysterical story in 1 Kings 22, 5 through 9. Hysterical. Jehos Jehoshaphat is a general, and he's got to go off to war. And the king's like, yeah, 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 go off to war. And then Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, can you get a prophet to tell me if this is what God wants me to do? And the king's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I have 400 prophets. And prophet for hire is a thing. Prophets would be paid by the kings and leaders, and they would just say whatever the king wanted to hear. Super stupid, but it happened all the time. Still happens today. So anyways, Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He asked the 400, and then he's like, oh, yeah, they said go. And Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going into battle because your 400 paid for hires guy say two thumbs up, recommend, because they're not the ones going into battle. Can you please go get a man of God? And there's a prophet named Micaiah. And the king is like, yeah, but I hate that guy. He never prophesies anything good for me. And it's a truly hysterical story. And the point being, Jehoshaphat, like Barak, are generals that understand victory is because the Lord gives it to you. And in the same way, Jehoshaphat says, no, 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 I need a prophet of God, an actual person who speaks for God to tell me that God is with me. Barak is like, hey, Deborah, you're all the way down here in the south. We're going to go up north and fight. You have the, the voice of God in your head. Please come with me. And what does she say? Oh, I'll gladly come. Sure. There's no hesitation. There's no like, mm, I don't know. I've got things down here. No, no, no. Instead, what we see is rather than a cowardly Barak, what I believe is actually happening here is he's a man of faith. And he recognizes, I'm about to go into a war where I am outmanned here. I, I am out-instrumented. I want someone who speaks on behalf of God with me. And what I think Barak is actually doing is he's actually being faithful here. Not only that, 
But rock is praised throughout the scriptures. Every other time he's mentioned, it's only a couple of times, but that's what we see. Through faith, he conquers kingdoms. Through faith. This is a man of faith, according to the Israelites. We as moderns want to call Barak a coward, which I'm sorry, I just can't imagine you read the scene where he goes and fights Sisera and calls him a coward. I think that's just ridiculous. But it's because we don't like the idea, not me, we being other people, don't like the idea of a woman leading and a man taking orders from a woman. But if you really see each other as azers and, and indispensable companions, they have different roles. He's a general. She's a prophet and a judge. They have different roles. They're going to work together to bring about good from the Lord to the people. The, you don't need to think hierarchy. It doesn't have to be a contest. Instead, it could just be people using their gifts and roles that God has given to them to bring about good. And so that I've already explained all this, but I just believe emphatically after studying this more and more that Deborah is doing her role as a prophetess speaking on behalf of God and Barak is doing his role as a general and a faithful general who says, okay, but I want someone who speaks for God because we're outmanned here. The battle seems bonkers. Again, 900 iron chariots, foot soldiers, they go to, and she's like, let's, I just think this would be the coolest movie. They're up on Mount Tabor and she's like, let's go. And they're like, ah, they run down the hill, cowards, right? No, they're not cowards, they run down the hill. And they cut off every man in Sisera's army. It's unbelievable. And then neither Barak or Deborah actually ultimately get the glory because it tells us that in the end that, whoop, 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 that God actually is the one doing all this. This is ultimately an act of faith. Deborah is not some genius that understood, hey, we can beat Sisera if we do this and do that. She's just speaking for God. And Barak is not some genius general who figured that like he's just doing what God calls him to do, which is why ultimately at the end of this scene, we say, hey, no, God is the one who destroys Jabez. So we have the scene, Barak goes out willing to fight, knowing someone else is going to get the glory. He's still willing to do it because he's being faithful to what God has called him to do through Deborah. And he goes out and battles, and it's an amazing thing. But notice, we do already have someone, though, that's another general in this story, and Sisera's men are getting cut down by the sword, and Sisera abandons his men and runs away on foot. So the story just keeps getting juicier. Because in the beginning, we're like, ooh, a woman's going to get the glory. Oh, is it Deborah? And we think it's Deborah. We're like, well, Deborah's going off to war. And you're like, oh. And then it's like, plot twist. And then the camera is like, shoo. So we've got the camera. It's focusing on Barack and Deborah. And it's like, go take home. And they go down. And, ah. and then all of a sudden, the camera zooms in on Sisera. And he's like, yeah, I'm out. And he abandons his men. Let's talk about a coward. He abandons his men, and then the camera zooms in on Yael, Jael, who is um, our woman. Barak is not your coward in this story. Barak believes the word of a prophet. He's willing to follow the leadership of the woman and allowing a woman to have the glory because there are some things in life greater than having your own glory, and Barak is able to demonstrate that to us. He courageously runs into battle when there's 900 iron chariots, and they've been winning for 20 years. I mean, the Canaanites have been beating them up for 20 years. He's your winner. Sisera abandons his troops, and he thinks nothing of Jael. He's like, oh, hey, little lady, <laughs> if a man comes looking for me, could you just send him the other way? I'm going to take a little nap. And she gets, okay, willing to go fight into battle, willing to listen to Deborah, not even worried about this woman who probably has massive biceps because she's a tent dweller. I mean, yo, what she does to his head is gross and graphic and, and it's disgusting. And, and yet, that's a, he thinks so little of her, not unlike Pharaoh, who thinks so little of women that he tells the Egyptians, kill all the baby boys, but it's Shipra and Pua, female midwives who rescue Moses. It is his own daughter who pulls Moses out of the water. It's Moses' sister who watches from a distance and approaches the princess and says, hey, I think you need a, a wet nurse. And then it's his mother who got like, Pharaoh is like, oh, I'm not worried about women. And it's women who ultimately bring about his demise because they're the ones willing to stand up and be courageous. This is sister. Oh, I'm not worried about a woman. Well, you should be. He gets a, peg, a, a tent peg driven through his head. He is your actual loser. So Jael becomes our fulfiller of the words. I, Jael, 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 there's no J in the Hebrew language. The way we wrote it over time, we added a J in, but 
So you might hear people say Yael or Yael, Jael, Jael. I always say Jael, Jael, or whatever. Anyways, all those are the same person. Again, the way the Hebrew works, she is either Jael, the wife of Heber, or she's the woman from the region Heber. That's what I think is going on. But anyways, uh, and notice how Sisera, again, he's not worried about her. <laughs> he is not. I think the reason why there's an oracle about this woman is because I think this has more to do with Sisera and less to do with Barak. And then chapter four ends, and of course, God is our hero. Now we get chapter 5, and it's a poetic retelling of chapter 4. Very normal. We see in Exodus 14, God rescues the people. In chapter 15, it's, this, it's like a military hymn would be the, uh, the title you give. It's a very normal thing in this ancient time period that we're in. Um, it's, it's awesome. Like Deb calls out the southern tribes who don't go fight. He's like, she's like, I saw you, Ephraim. I was like, you're not doing anything, which I think is hilarious. Uh, and then we get a really dark turn. Okay, so the poem, these military poems are, they're, they're victorious and they're meant to shame the people who lost. And so oftentimes they're written in ways that we would go, oh, that's, that's graphic or that's dark. Now, I've never been to war. I don't pretend to understand. Like, I'm saying this is a, this is a genre, but the darkness is accomplishing what it's supposed to do. It's pointing out how, how truly evil the, the people were that they defeated. And so this is where we get a dark turn. So part of the dark turn is we also, in the same way Barak and Sisera are foils to each other, Deborah and Sisera's mother, and Sisera's mother shows up in this poem. And so Deborah is called the mother of Israel. Uh, it, she leads the Israelites to army with Barak. She's a faithful gal, winner, yay, Deborah, yay, name your kids Deborah. Sisera's mother, it says she watched from a latticed window, which is to say like she comes from wealth. In other words, she's been... She's been enjoying the spoils of victory. She's been enjoying this. Um, and it says, like, she's, gonna, she's looking forward to the nice clothes that she's going to get when her son comes back from having harmed the Israelites. And she says she believes that her husband, this should say her son, not her husband, that her son is probably getting two girls per soldier for them to rape. Now, the way the poetry says it, it says a womb or two for each soldier. And then that and other commentators say this is clearly... Uh, this is clearly language that's meant to say, hey, she, she's sitting in her lattice window, and she's like, oh, where's my son? It's getting late into the day. By now, each shoulder should be getting two girls that they can take back with them to, to harm and to sexually assault, which is just, it, it's beyond wicked, right? And so this is what his mom's doing. This is what the mother of Israel is doing. And in other words, she's the loser. Like, this is... This is wickedness embodied. And of course, her son's not coming back to her. And that is its own painful thing. But that's the point. Is you, you are sitting in a lattice window and you're hoping to, you're rejoicing in this. And as a woman, what are you doing? Like, you, you shouldn't rejoice in it. We should all as humans agree this is, you shouldn't do that. Um, okay, so Judges 4 and 5. I know I powered through that, but I wanted to keep this short. Deborah and Barak are partners dare I say, indispensable companions based on the terms that we used last week. Sisera and his mother, those are the real troublemakers. And Jael, I mean, my goodness, like that woman, I just, I, I can't even imagine. But anyways, this story has its, it has its heroes. It has its protagonists and it has its antagonists. It has its comparisons of these generals and these, like you don't need to make Barack and Deborah something they're not. And in order to do that, in order to make Barack a coward and Deborah should never have been there, you hang all of that on one verse out of this entire story, which is to say, yes, a woman is going to get the glory. And if you just pull the camera back a little bit and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're going to call that guy a coward? Mm, good luck selling that. Because if I was like, hey, I want to tell you about Barack, and you're like, okay, tell me about Barack. You're like, okay, Barack. He takes men into battle. He is told by a prophet of God, God will hand these people who've been kicking your rear for 20 years. He's going to hand them over to you today. Oh, they have chariots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they got more equipment than you can even imagine. But you're going to win. So just run into battle, and you're going to win. And by the way, there's a prophet telling you to do all this. But here's the thing. When the prophet said this is going to happen, he asked the prophet, will you come with me? So, so Barak's a coward. Any thoughtful person would be like, chopped off a whole lot of that info there. Uh, 
including the Bible saying by faith he conquered kingdoms, and including Hebrews 11 being like, he's a faithful guy. Like, I, if your biases are causing you to not allow the story to speak for itself on the terms in which the story brings itself to us, then you need to go back, and you need to let the story speak for itself from its context in the way that it's supposed to. This story's got it all. It's an awesome story. And on its own, it's an incredible story of a man and a woman, not related, able to be brothers and sisters in this war. And it brings about 40 years of peace for the Israelite people. You know how hard it is for the Israelite people throughout the Old Testament to get peaceful year? It happens so infrequently. This is a good moment. It's a good moment. And so I just think if we can come to this story and allow the story to speak for itself, Sisera's the bad guy. He's the coward. He walks away on foot. Barak, not Sisera. Deborah is a great mother of Israel. She's a leader of Israel. Sisera's mother, mm, no, you have to get your woman card. you got to give it back. And Jael, whew. Anyways, I think it's an incredible story. And I think if you allow it to speak to us the way it's meant to, and you consider these things about the leadership of this man and this woman, I think it's one of those really rare, beautiful pictures of where men and women together partner. Now, when you're done with this lesson, I want you to go and I want you to read about the rest of the women and judges. And what you're going to find is we start here and then we spiral downward. I'm not going to tell you what happens at the end of the book, but I had a professor in seminary tell me, you can tell how Israel's doing by the way they treat their women. And so go look. Go look. All right, moving on. Uh, if you're watching this with somebody, ask each other what stood out to you, all that good stuff. All right, Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, when you hear the Proverbs 31 woman, what often comes to mind? Now, if you grew up in the spaces that are more conservative and evangelical, chances are what you heard was this is a stay-at-home wife, this is the ideal of women, and this is what you, men, this is what you should look for in a wife, and women, this is what you should aspire to be. So much so, it became almost like a meme or a trope. Woman, get back in the kitchen. Don't you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman? Woman, clean up my meal. Don't you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman? Okay. Okay. So, I'm going to make the argument. She is less June Cleaver and more so like international woman of mystery. Okay? So, we're going to let, the, again, we're going to let the text speak to it on their own. Let's read Proverbs 31. Hit pause, read it. Okay. Seriously, hit pause and read it, especially verse 10 forward. All right. First and foremost, this is a proverb from a queen to her son. So you need to, first of all, put this in the context of royalty. And she's saying, hey, son, this is what you need to be looking for in a wife, okay? Some people assume it's, a Sol it's Solomon, uh, or excuse me, it's Bathsheba writing to Solomon. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, but it's very normal in this time period for there to be Proverbs written by kings or two kings. In other words, like, what is wisdom embodied, okay? So this is a, a queen writing to her royal son, okay? And, and the mom has some advice. And it starts with, you need to look for a noble wife. This is a very important term. It's Isha Shael, okay? Isha, I'm not good with Hebrews. Isha Shael, Shael, whatever. It means noble woman. Ruth is also called a noble woman. Ultimately, this is the whole point of saying, hey, hey, son, I think that's weird. Hey, son, you need to look for a wife, okay? You need to look for a woman of valor, and then she's going to explain to him the kinds of things a woman of valor would be doing, okay? This is how you'll know she's a woman of valor. This is a really important, this is a really important word, okay? Same word she's to describe Ruth, so bury that down in your brain somewhere. Okay, so what's our noble woman doing? It's a lot. Trustworthy to her husband, she buys goods and makes products, rises up early to feed her family and her female servants. Again, queen. Bought a good piece of property, she's in real estate, planted a vineyard from her own income. Yeah, because those are cheap. She has strong arms and legs from her industrious work, or she works out to have strong arms and legs. The Hebrew's not clear. Again, Hebrew makes up its own words or rules. She inspects the quality of her merchandise, she's quality control. Works till late into the night, she sews from the spool and the spindle, she's, she may close. 
takes care of the needy, which is great. She has created fine clothes for the winter. She sells even more merchandise. Yay, she has a famous hubby. Awesome, who wouldn't want that? She speaks with wisdom and instruction. She's not lazy. Her children love her. She fears the Lord, and she deserves a little credit. I, I think she's tired, y'all. Like, I, truly, what has happened to this, this proverb is meant to say, here are the kinds of things that a noble woman at this socioeconomic class would be doing, okay? It's a queen to her son. It's not a checklist. It, it's not a, hey, she does, like, okay, okay, okay. It's certainly not a daily checklist. The idea is that a noble woman is going to care about people. She's going to work hard. She's going to be wise in the way that she spends money and especially able to do these things because this woman has servants. She has people that do things for her. This is a noble picture of a woman at that level of socioeconomic class. So notice the thing, it's royal. She has female servants. And the summary verse is you're looking for someone who fears the Lord. You're looking, this is the bookend of it. You want a noble woman. And a noble woman at this level is gonna do a lot of these things. But ultimately it's because she fears the Lord, right? That's what the Proverbs 31 woman is. It's not a stay at home wife. And again, there is nothing wrong with being a stay at home wife. I think part of the problem with, with the whole idea that Proverbs 31 is a stay at home wife is we've actually devalued the work of staying at home. You are meant to do what God calls you to do. And if that's staying at home, great, but don't, don't buy into the lie that that's what Proverbs 31 is teaching. This woman was engaged in international like retail for crying out loud. She was out in the city buying fields and merchandise and whatever. Like this woman worked, but she also had servants. If I had servants, oh my gosh, I would get stuff done. So my friend Catherine, when I was in seminary, we had to, we <laughs> essentially I forced this proverb on her in our preaching class. It's a longer story, but I'm trying to keep this short. So what ended up happening though is Catherine gave me the side eye because no woman wants to preach Proverbs 31 in a class. There were two women and 10 men. And no woman wants it because this, this passage has been weaponized against women for so many years. But something really beautiful happened is the more Catherine studied it, the more like beauty and goodness came out of it. And actually she ended up uh, writing a study on it and getting published in a couple of different areas. And so I just took her word. She needs to thank me for setting her on this trajectory by being a jerk and taking the other proverb. But anyways, she says in the Hebrew Old Testament, immediately after the book of Proverbs comes the story of two widows, Ruth and Naomi who are about as far from a palace as they could be. These two women, related by marriage, are homeless, and they are at risk of starving death. That is, until one of them, the one who is also called the Isha Shael, a woman of valor, she risks everything to provide for her mother-in-law, of course, goes to the field of Boaz, and her selfless act leads to being praised by the city gates, one of the very things that is said about the Proverbs 31 woman. Just like the book of Proverbs. In Jewish traditions, many see Ruth, in Jewish tradition, this is what the Jewish people say, they see Ruth as the flesh and blood example of a Proverbs 31 woman. And if that's true, then standing side by side in the pages of scripture are a queen and a homeless woman. Do you get the, like the socioeconomic differences here are staggering. The opportunity and the opportunity, like they're, they are staggeringly different, but both of them are called Ishat Shael because it has nothing to do with that list of things. Now, look, if you, have, if you are noble and you fear the Lord and you have opportunity and privilege and money and resources, then you're going to do some of these things. You're not gonna be like Sisera's mother sitting behind a lattice window eating the, like, the, the fruit of injustice. That's not what a woman of valor does. So it makes sense that this queen would be out looking after people, taking care of her servants, taking care of her family. She can do that. What is Ruth doing? Making it to the next day. But being faithful and clinging to Naomi. And they are both queen and homeless woman and considered women of valor. Catherine goes on. She says, the interesting thing about Proverbs 31 is that it is chock full of military imagery. The Hebrew uses words like spoils, as in spoils of war, and prey. And verse 17 could literally be translated, she girds her loins, which is a very like warlike phrase. Verse 29 describes her as having done valiantly. All of these are terms that are normally used in the Old Testament in hero heroic warfare literature. But here God uses it to describe a woman. Not unlike Azer, right? This woman is not a pastels only, soft-spoken, doesn't have her own opinions kind of woman. Now hear me. 
if you like pastels and soft spoken, you can also be a woman's idol. I think Catherine took the stereotype of the Proverbs 31 woman and was like, hey, let's push back against that. I don't care what colors you love. I don't care, like, your Pantone of the year. I don't care how loud or soft spoken you are. The question is, are you a woman of noble character? And you will know that by your fear of the Lord and the way that you treat others and you treat your family. That, that's the point of all of this. But the language is strong, warlike language, just like Genesis 2. Why do you think God keeps doing this? It's a question to ponder. Proverbs 31 is not a stay-at-home mom wife. Again, there's nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home wife. That's not the point of Proverbs 31, though. The point of Proverbs 31 is, hey, son, you're going to need to pick a wife. And by pick, I mean pick. Like, there was a range of marriages back then. So what is it that you should be valuing? You should be valuing noble character. And the world will tell you to value, like, blonde hair, blue eyes. That's what I have. That was weird. Uh, certain body type, certain socioeconomic class, certain way they dress, certain way they, like, and the Bible says, I don't care if you're a homeless woman or a queen, what makes you valuable as a wife, that's weird. I know, you're valuable because you belong to God. But... The point is the thing that we should be striving after for ourselves, men and women, and in our relationships, is to be people of character. <laughs> character. All right, so what's our big so what? Women are supposed to be strong. Genesis 2, Azer, warrior, strong helper. Proverbs 31, warrior, like you have girded your loins. Deborah, I'll go into battle with you. These are incredible women, right? Why? Why do you think that? The world is utterly broken. And if only half of humanity is strong, we're missing out on some serious strength. We need men and women to be strong in the Lord. Now notice, I'm not saying arrogant, loud, bombastic, difficult. What happens is when people like me teach these things, because we can be loud and bombastic and difficult, I know, I know that my personality is bigger and louder. You can't help but think that's what I'm importing into this. I'm not. If you like pastels and you're soft-spoken, but you are, you are doing what God's called you to do, I will celebrate that. If you are loud <laughs> like me, but you are doing what God calls you to do, I will celebrate that. But it doesn't really matter if I celebrate it. The question is, what is God calling you into? And I believe God is calling all of humanity into strength. Now, men, I think, intuit this. Barack understands his role. He's a general. But I think women don't necessarily understand this. And I think what should be a mark of Christianity is women who understand their strength is an asset. Not a detriment, but an asset. And if men and women could partner together, they would understand strength is something beautiful that God gives to us. Men and women, of course, are supposed to partner together. Come on, y'all. Lightning and fire. Fire and lightning. How can y'all not think that that is the super dopest thing in all the Bible? Okay. Um, some theologians really want Barak to be a coward. And, and the reason why they want that is because they want to explain away Deborah. And in order to explain away Deborah, they've got to have a fall guy, and that becomes Barak. But we, we already have a villain and a villainess in this story. You don't need, like, maybe, just maybe, just allow the story to stand on its own. And listen, if you're a Bible scholar and you're a complementarian and you believe that men should have leadership and people go, okay, but explain Barak and Deborah, you go, yeah, I don't know, it's aberrant. I, I actually don't know what to do with that. I think Barak was a, an incredible general. I think Deborah spoke on behalf of God. I think it's weird. I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. The rest of the pattern of scripture seems to be male leadership. You could say that and be honest, right? Because, again, it's your modern problem. That makes you feel like you have to explain this away in terms that maybe the ancient people go, yeah, it was weird, but we had a woman leading us. It was strange, but, you know, that's what happens. Just be true to what the text is teaching, though. And then if you're a egalitarian like me, you're like, nah, that's what it looks like. Fire and lightning, that's what it's supposed to look like. Clearly, I'm excited about this. And then finally, um, the last so what, or no, there's one more so what. A woman of valor is a woman of noble character and faithfulness. And, and this is what women are supposed to be. Who care? It's not who cares if you stay at home. Right? These are really personal and intimate decisions. And look, part of the difficulty in all this is before men didn't go to work. You know, there were times that men and women were together with their families working on their farms or their textile business or whatever, right? So now men are gone from the home for hours on the day, and I understand the desire to want to have a parent there with the kid. I'm not knocking that. But it's not the biblical norm is what I'm knocking. 
And that's just silly. Nowhere in the Bible do we see this post-industrial revolution set up. And so what I would just say is men and women should be seeking to be people of noble character. And frankly, the world needs more of that. And that's my point is the world is just utterly broken. We need strength in every area. We need people who are strong in the home and workplaces and politics and media and church and family. But we just need to make sure we're defining strength as God does. And it's strength of character. It's strength of faith. Not loud and bombastic and whatever. Do you believe God? Do you walk with God? Do you cling to God? Do you love him? Do you love your neighbors? Do you love the people around you? Do you care for the vulnerable? Do you do the things that bring about the, the good and the flourishing of those around you? All right, friends. Nobody's told you that they love you. I do. Way more important than God does. This was week two. Uh, next week we're going to do Jesus, and hopefully it will be a lot of fun. So grace and peace.